Let's do some bios before we get into the questions. Um, I will start at the very end with Arthur, Arthur Nazarian. He's a photojournalist and filmmaker whose work often focuses on the immigrant experience. His photography has appeared in outlets such as the New York Times, CNN, The Atlantic, The Guardian, and Public Radio International, for whom he's also a contributing writer. Arthur is currently filming another documentary about the Somali community in Minneapolis with support from the Tribeca Film Institute. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you. Next to him is Mike Shum. He's a Chinese-American documentary director and cinematographer. He started in video journalism in 2009, working in and out of East and Central Africa. Since then, he's covered stories ranging from Eastern Congo's M23 rebels to the rise of ISIS in Northern Iraq. He was also the director of photography and producer of the 2017 Tribeca Film Festival's Audience Award winner, Hondros. See it if you haven't yet. Um, let's give it up for uh, a, a mic. Thanks. And then Halima, of course, needs no introduction, but I will share a bit of the backstory about how I came to meet her. I don't know if I could say that we're personal friends just yet, but maybe after tonight, if she likes my questions, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see. So I had the pleasure of meeting Halima um, in February, actually, back at um, Howard University in Washington, D.C., where I'm based. And we were at an event called um, the Howard hijab fest and what it is it's this gathering of women um, from all over to um, kind of share stories it's it's a it's an event of empowerment an event uh, celebrating sisterhood and also celebrating fashion so you can see why Halima was there so it was after she got up on stage and was talking about her story um, of um, transitioning from the Kakuma refugee camp to uh, the world of modeling here in the US that I kind of bum rushed her afterwards, as journalists sometimes do, to try to convince her to come on my show, The Stream. And at the time she mentioned, oh, Al Jazeera? Al Jazeera's been following me for a very long time. You guys are doing a documentary on me. And Al Jazeera is a very big place, um, but I think in my hubris, I thought I would know if there had been a team of camera people following um, the first hijabi uh, you know, runway model around. So I said, oh, that's really nice, but I kind of totally forgot about it. Sorry, Halima. <laughs> Fast forward um, to today. Um, I was successful in getting her on the show. Um, she's been on the show two times, one to talk about going back to the Kakuma refugee camp, and the other time was um, live from New York Fashion Week just a couple months ago in September, so that was awesome. But now we're here on the stage. I finally saw the film. She finally saw the film, so let's get into what you thought of the film. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm like, I need a second to catch up. This is my first time seeing this too. I am so grateful. Like, you don't know how hard of a time I gave these two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 100 hours of just following, and I did not think you guys would capture anything. I'm like, do you guys know I wake up, go to sleep? Like, I told Denise, I'm like, they want to do a documentary. Do they not know how boring my life is? <laughs> So I, I'm so impressed by how you guys filmed, and it's it's so it was so beautiful. I think um, they really did share my story, and um, I can't wait to share it with my mom. Um, your mom is not here. You told me before. Um, you know, you wanted to be the the person that saw it first before the rest of your family sees it. What do you think your mom will think? She's definitely gonna be like, could you not have told me the lighting was this way? <laughs> <laughs> My mom is very sarcastic. <laughs> um, she's definitely gonna give me some runway tips and tour the way. <laughs> she's definitely gonna give, yeah, she's gonna give me a lot of good tips. <laughs> but I think she's gonna be so proud. Like you guys did such a beautiful job of highlighting her and you know, she's funny. She's this strong woman that I look up to and you guys really did do us justice in this film. So I'm, I'm so excited. My family's gonna be over the moon. Oh, that's awesome. Mike and Arthur, so as I mentioned in your um, bios, you guys um, do work that is not at all typical of the world of fashion. So you have covered, you know, uh, people fleeing from ISIS violence. You have covered uh, victims of landmines. Where did the inspiration for this film come from? You want to start? Or? I mean, it's. It, it, I think you're right. I think uh, 
I wouldn't say Arthur and I would have naturally come to a story of, of this kind. Am I correct? Arthur? I think that's that's correct. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I, I I think I can speak for Mike when I say this: a good story is a good story, and yeah. this is a a story about a, a very interesting um, person who it, it's to me when when I met Halima, I think it was in Perkins Diner in St. Cloud. It took about ten minutes until I realized, wow, this is this is. This is not just about fashion, which is not something I admittedly know that much about. Are you sure? Are I'm you sure? I'm 100% sure. Okay. Also, okay. did but you guys dress as twins on purpose? Yeah. <laughs> this like comes the, up a lot. Okay. <laughs> so it was, it, it, I think it was just on the cusp of this like mute, meteoric rise um, in, in, in the fashion world for you. And I, and I could see that um, you were so introspective and, and contemplative about what that meant, not just for you, but for your community. And I, I think, you, if I'm not mistaken, you were 20 at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, when I was 20, I would, if, and if I were in that position, I, I don't think I would have been that. <laughs> so I thought, this is really incredible. And, and as, as a character, I, you know, so I immediately I called Mike and I said, this is a, this is a story that, that should be told. And, and beyond just the headlines that had been coming out. I, I admit, too, uh, when, when he called me and after I said, oh, I'm interested, I hung up the phone and I said, I don't know if... <laughs> If, if fashion is really for, for me, necessarily, I mean, um, but I think after much discussion Arthur and I had, and, and, and we did a lot of research, we, we, we read a lot about more you know, about fashion, about the community, but also I think, uh, at least for me, and I, and I think I can speak for Arthur as well too, when we do film and work, we try to see a sense of ourselves in, in, in our work. And the first question was, well, <laughs> how can I ever relate to a Somali supermodel in Minnesota? That doesn't, I, I don't see how that could play out, but uh, it was your family's story a little bit more than, than, than I, I, I realized, especially the relationship between you and your mother. I think that was very important to me. So in terms of inspiration, as well as uh, things that sort of pushed us, uh, me in this direction, it was very much uh, being able to convince your mother that uh, you are going in this direction. Because I've had to do the same with my own mother uh, doing filmmaking. And I could see that sort of uh, parallel. My, my parents are from China, they're immigrants. And the idea of being a doctor and an engineer or something like that was very big in their minds. And I, I very much felt that experience. And it's not a, a unique experience. It's a very common American experience, I think. And I think that's something that um, I think, especially Arthur as well, being an immigrant from Russia, I think we all could sort of share that, that, uh, that, that uh, thread that we could all, that they pulled right through our stories as well too. So we want to tell that story because you're telling a little bit of all of our stories to some extent. So. Yeah, I think I've lost count of how many times my own parents have asked me to get, to get a real job, <laughs> so to speak. And you know, and that's, that's tough to explain. I, I'm an immigrant myself and, and it's hard to explain that you can be so passionate about something that doesn't have a regular income and that has a, you know, admittedly an unstable kind of future, which could be very successful or could be, you don't know what. And from their perspective, it's it's hard to, to understand why you would want to go down that route. But uh, to be sure, as I know Halima is, to be sure that it's the correct way, I thought that was a really fascinating thing to capture that I could relate to. By the way, my mom still hands me job applications. <laughs> <laughs> Me, me, me too. <laughs> so your mom, speaking of, um, was, was definitely one of the stars, at least for me, of this film. Um, she was kind of a shining light. She's funny. She's sarcastic. Um, she, she definitely is um, uh, something that draws the attention in this documentary. What was it like coming to her to say, I'm going to be in a documentary, but also we want you to be in a documentary. And I know that our panelists, I'm just gonna give you a little teaser. All of our panelists have a really good story about this, so I wanna hear from all of them on this. <laughs> Go ahead, Halima. Well, for me, when they said, we're gonna do a documentary, I was like, okay, <laughs> it's gonna be good. You know, it's just me, 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 me. And then they're like, no, we want your friends, <laughs> family. <laughs> and then I was like, how do I explain to these people that <laughs> My mother's never been on camera besides license, not even license photo, just passport, state IDs, that's it, you know? Immigration documents. <laughs> we don't have any family photos at the house, you know? Um, so I was like, how am I gonna explain? <laughs> and I was like, I was like thinking of ways to like tell them, and you guys were very like, you guys responded to that, but 
it definitely was a huge part of my story and I understood why that needed to be in this documentary. This is my mom, this is <laughs> who gave birth to me. But it was really challenging. I don't think my mom said yes until literally the final, the final um, yeah. filming day. You know, this was like a year into it. My mom was like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> I was like, did you change your mind? Wait for it. Nope. <laughs> so, yeah, that was like how I kind of understood. And it was really stressful even for me because I'm like, how do I? <laughs> we were on the road to St. Cloud. So it, we actually, we, this is the last, if I'm not mistaken, the last day of the shoot after, how many months was it? Um, at that yeah. Point. yeah, and so we were on the road to St. Cloud to interview uh, your sister, Fatima, right? And then about a third of the way there, we got a call that she's not going to do it anymore. So at this point, I'm like looking for the exit ramp to turn around, <laughs> thinking, okay, well, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen now, but that's, that's that. And then we got a second call, which is my, my mom agreed to it. And then if you look, the speedometer just went like this, just <laughs> straight to St. Cloud, and that's, that's how that happened. Taped everybody up. It was go 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 go. No time wasted. And <laughs> Cause I was like, I don't know if my mom's gonna change her mind. So we gotta roll cameras on right away. <laughs> Introduce after we film. I, I think you guys told the story perfectly. I mean, that that's exactly how it went. And I and I have to say, and just reminded me, uh, one thank you in terms of the production of the film and pulling it together is Denise. Uh, she really helped pull. Uh, she was the one calling us, basically. To <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> yes, no, yes. And, and that was basically our relationship with, with Halim and her team. Uh, it, was, it was difficult. I, I, I admit, and based on the story that I just said about the motivation to, to even do the documentary, it was pretty upsetting, I guess, in a sense, over time, where I thought, I don't think we'll be able to tell this story that I could personally relate to. And that, that, that's something that... I actually did feel, and we've talked about it, I, I, we knew that uh, your mother met, means so much to you. And to sort of leave that out was sort of for us thinking that it's, we're not gonna be telling the truth, I think, if we left it out. We didn't, there, there wouldn't be much of uh, you in there without where you came from. And I think that was very important to us when we were putting it together. So when, when we did get the call to say yes, yeah, that speedometer went up, and we actually strategized, like, we gotta start rolling right away. We gotta keep this moving. I don't know how long she's gonna be on camera until she just walks out. I mean, I, I have no idea, but we gotta make this work, right? So. Mike is great under pressure, so everything just fell into place. <laughs> my mom was, was so natural, guys. On camera, she was like, Fadisa, Fadisa, I got the story. <laughs> she was literally like, sit down, I'll explain to them. <laughs> and then I was like, gee, mom, you wonder where I get it from? <laughs> Yeah, there was, I was just uh, recounting the story. Uh, there was definitely a moment where her mother, through a friend who's helping translate, but also in, in some English as well, too, she's like, now that the cameras are on, I, want, I, have, I have questions for her. And I literally was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Arthur and I are like, by all means, we don't want to, we, we're done interviewing. You, you can start interviewing now. You grill so. your daughter. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a life of its own. It started off as kind of an interview. And then after, I think, 15 minutes, I think your mom kind of realized that this is an opportunity to really ask some questions. And it took a life of its own, and we just, Mike and I just stepped back. Okay, let's see, let's see where this goes. Let's see where this goes, yeah. <laughs> and I, I like the fact that she, this is an opportunity for her to ask some questions on tape so that there is a record. So, so you know, there's always something to look back on. And so in rewatching it for the second time for myself, one of the things I was struck by in that conversation when you guys are on the couch is that the idea for being a UNICEF ambassador, which you are now, came from your mom. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. How, what happened when that announcement came? What did your mom say? Okay, so my mom, I don't know if you guys understood from the documentary, but she's really not a big fan of like the you know modeling and all that stuff. She doesn't get it, you know? Um, but I, I'll never forget, I brought home my first Vogue cover and I was like, mom, this, it's never happened in over 102 years for there to be a hijabi, you know, forget being a, a Somali hijabi, you know what I mean? Like, this has never happened in 102 years. And I was like, hey, hey, mashallah. But don't, forget the, don't forget the dishes. That was her main concern. And so I bring home my, my last, it was like a couple, uh, the CR fashion book um, cover. And this time, it, it was the first time that UNICEF 
had um, partnered up with a fashion magazine, and it was on the front cover. Gigi and I were both wearing our UNICEF shirts, and I brought that home. Like, I literally ran with it, and I was like, Mom, look at this. And she was, like, really, really over the moon and so proud of me. And again, when I went back to Kakuma, like, I can't tell you how proud. I've never seen my mom cry because she was so proud of me. <laughs> so that was, like... Uh, you know, because, like, so, I don't know, like, it's just not in our dakan to be, like, over, overly, I don't know, like, we know our parents love us, we know they care about us, but will they tell us that every day? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not, you know, but that was a major, major thing. Like, when I was named, announced UNICEF ambassador, she's like, there you go, you finally did something right. You finally listened to your mother. I was like, yes. <laughs> And the other time, she was just keeping you humble. You know, cover of Vogue, go wash the dishes, okay, keeping the other, you humble. Just like African aunties, forget, my mom is, like, you guys didn't interview my aunts, okay? My aunts in Somalia, they're so shady. My aunt, I'll, I'll never forget. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah, we'll, Bring it we'll, on. Do it. we'll do it. Part two. <laughs> no, seriously, I'll never forget. I was like, Mom, I'm like doing, uh, no, I was like uh, t uh, talking to my aunt, and I was like, I'm walking in New York Fashion, no, it was Milan Fashion Week, and I was like, it's my first show, it's really huge for my career, and she's like, so walking around in America, is that, in, in heels, is that considered a real job? <laughs> that kept me humble, <laughs> really, really humble. That's amazing. But also harder than it looks. Um, so... Obstacles, challenges, we all want to hear the juicy stuff. What was the hardest part for you two as filmmakers? And then I'll get um, the view from Halima. What was the biggest obstacle you think in this? The threat is still. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I was, it's, not, it's not too different from what, what, what we have been talking about. I mean, I think, um, well, okay, the, the very surface level obstacle was there's been a lot of media about you. I mean, there's been a lot of media about Halima. There's a lot of uh, stories and magazine covers, magazine covers and, and, and videos and, and commercials. But so, so the question for us was, well, what, what can we do to, how can we say anything, anything different than anyone else has? I think that was our first major obstacle. Yeah, and I think even, so of course there was the obstacle of, of getting your mother to agree to be on camera, and we've talked about that, but I think even even with that, how do you tell that story in a nuanced way that honors the the, re, the, the complexity of, of the relationship? Because it, it would be easy, and I think inaccurate, to just make it like your mom doesn't agree, and you do, and there's that conflict. But in, in reality, I think there's a lot more to it, where your mom, she sees why why you're doing this, and to convey that there's a sense of acceptance, but also a lack of understanding culturally, and perhaps that that complexity to, to relay that in 25 minutes, I, I think was was a challenge, but I hope I hope that we were able to to do that. Yours? For me, I, I mean, I just say that like I was like uh, everybody in my family is super camera shy, <laughs> you know, and so it's in a way like I I understand it's not fair to my family because they didn't pick this life, you know what I mean? Like I'm the one who's modeling, I'm the one who's. So to ask them to be on camera when they've never done that before. My brother came in. I think he saw, I think he saw you coming yeah. in with the camera. He's like, bye. <laughs> he didn't come back for two days. <laughs> he, stayed, he stayed at my cousin's house. <laughs> so it was just like, how do I tell the world? Because like, you know, it's just a different culture. You know what I mean? Like my mom valued education. And so for me to be bringing home cameras and for modeling, you can see how that wouldn't necessarily go well <laughs> um i don't know but i i, I just want to quick say thank you to denise because she really did come through you know like i i always say it's so nice having you because it's like best of both worlds you know my mom is my mom but then you're like my work mom too so mm -hmm. love you <laughs> yep. oh and like thank you to everybody for coming i know this is so late my best friends <laughs> And we're also going to um, open up uh, to the audience for Q&A. Um, so I'm not going to steal all the questions. I just had a couple more um, before we do that. Um, one of the things that the film reveals is something that anyone, especially a woman, if you're on the internet, if you're on Instagram, you know because it happens to you. But it's the comments about how you look, um, whether that is 
if you wear a scarf, that you're not wearing it correctly. If you don't wear a scarf, it's that you should be wearing a scarf. Um, if it's if you're not Muslim at all, it's just about, oh, you look fat, or you look skinny, or you look this, or you look that. Being able to see that on camera and see you deal with it, deal with someone who probably means very well, um, what does that do internally? Because you know you looked really composed up there, but I'm sure that you get much worse and sometimes much more love. But how do you deal with all of that? I would say, um, I mean, I, I, I think the best thing about growing up Somali American is like, you just learn, like people have different ways of thinking. And right away, when that girl messaged me, hey, I'm a big fan, but I think this dress is too tight, love ya. I knew right away she wasn't coming from a place of like, her, like harm. It was just really, that's, that's like another sister which, you know what I mean? She's coming from a place of love, you know? And, and I sometimes think, I don't think that person was bullying me. They just, you know, it's like, a, she, that was her way of giving me advice. You know, in her heart, she thought she was doing, giving me really good advice. So I, I'd say for me, I just explained to her like, girl, this was, I didn't say this on camera, but I was like, girl, this dress was like 24 bucks. I loved it. It was a bargain. Da, 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 da. <laughs> you know, I felt like a million bucks in it. Why not? You know what I mean? And the other thing is, it's all so relative to the person. You know, like you define what modesty is for yourself. Like I used to beat myself over comments and, you know, because you're right. You know, like I could wear a turban like you. Why is your neck showing? I could wear a scarf. Why are you not wearing a jilbab? I could wear a jilbab and it's why aren't you, you know what I mean? There's so many different ways that people critique us women and it's just, Sometimes I feel like there's nothing that's good enough because I've also seen the opposite where, you know, work, working uh, uh, in the industry or um, even the pageants, you know, like some of those girls even get really bad comments. Like, why are you in a bikini on stage, you know, brains over beauty? And it's like, excuse me, sir, you don't know that this woman is, a, you know, she's going to school to become a neuroscientist. Um, so I feel like as women, we can't win sometimes, no matter what spectrum of modesty or immodest or whatever you are, you know? So it's best to just dress how you want to dress, wear what makes you feel beautiful, and so be it. Arthur and Mike, um, keeping that in mind, were there any things that surprised you? Did you learn anything? I mean, you're following around. This is a, it's a new world because it's it's modeling, it's fashion, but also it's also a, 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 a female-dominated world. What did you learn? That I'm not very fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> um, okay. Well, no, that's a that's a great question because I think part of our job. Uh, is is, and and what we had pitched to to uh, to Halima and her team was uh, observation. I mean, part of our f f uh, goal was to, of course, we have ideas going in, and we have uh, you leading a very intense and interesting life. But also, the the learning curve of it was fascinating, partially because, uh, yeah, the fashion world is just worlds that we're not quite familiar with. But it really is interesting, especially that scene you, you had spoken of, uh, Malika. Uh, the, I think for us, we, we, we tried to decompress over, uh, over throughout the course of the shoot, and that was a moment where we thought, wow, like this is something that you, you, you took, well, one, very quickly, but also uh, it seemed so common, and I think that was a big surprise for, for us where we don't have to deal with that as men. Uh, really at, at, at all, in my opinion, at least I don't, and uh, because we flo float so, so under the radar, and I think that was part of the compelling add to your story in that well, you've put yourself literally on the world stage, and taking that kind of pressure, uh, much less having two guys with cameras, I mean, for us, we felt like, well, this, this is gonna be the least of your problems because you have to face the world every day when you, when you put yourself out there, and so that challenge, I think, uh, earned, like, I respect uh, like far greater than when we than w what we anticipated, and I think that was uh, something that we really want to show, uh, not because uh, not 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 because it was important so much as it's something that we had learned too. So it was both of that. I think we we knew it was important because we were learning something from your from from following you around. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> <laughs> Mike is so surprised. 
Like, like, what? <laughs> I'm behind the camera, thank you. Okay. I think it also, your answer that you just gave, Halima, also answers uh, one of the earlier questions, which is why, why, were we, we, why were we interested in this story? And I think it was actually during that scene when I realized the depth of like how, how, you, th how you see yourself in your, in your position, not, in, not only in this community, but like to, to uh, women everywhere. And you have that voice and uh, to see you use it that way in such a considered and kind of authentic way. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of, that was early on in the shoot. Yeah, and I, and I realized, early, yeah, yeah, there's something really um, profound to communicate here that transcends uh, the fashion world. And that's not to diminish the fashion world, which I, th I think is actually fascinating in itself because we got, to, like, look, honestly, I lived in New York. I never thought I'd end up in New York Fashion Week. This is not a place I ever thought I'd end up. And I got to see this world that that's people take very seriously and they work really hard and, and they're artists. And uh, I got to see Halima uh, take part in, in that and, and the, the intensity is, is really admirable. And not, and not, just, not just take part, I, I, I wanna make sure to credit you on uh, the fact that you're doing this as the first and, and, and the, you know, you on the phone, for me, was a representation of really being out there and standing up. I think that's uh, so much more difficult than I didn't, I mean, I really didn't realize that. I didn't see that just from the covers and the, the articles, but just really seeing you get up every day and say, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna decide on being here, knowing fully well that criticism of the community, you know, skepticism from your mother, um, you've made this decision to move forward. And I think a lot of people can learn, not learn from that, but just be inspired by that. It inspires me as well, so. Fantastic, okay, I think it's time to open it up to the audience for Q&A. How should we do this? Is there a mic going around or? Okay, fantastic, so there is a mic here um, and you'll be roving around. All right, questions? Thank you, it's a really beautiful film. Yeah. I loved your mother. Your mother was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, did you also edit the film? Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Um, no, I didn't. So Eugene Yi, who's a, an incredible filmmaker and editor, uh, he couldn't be here tonight. Uh, he's in New York uh, taking care of his new child, but he, uh, he's the writer. I helped co-write it, but he is the, uh, the spear of, of how he was able to put pulled the story together. We went through many permutations, but Eugene Yi uh, was the editor-writer of the film, so. But Mike deserves a lot of credit in the editing process. <laughs> <Let's do. laughs> he, took, he played a big role. Um, also, did you have an outline before you filmed? Did you know what you wanted early on? How did you s set up your shoots? No, that's a really, that's Thank a really you. good question. Um, I, I, yeah, I have an answer, but you should start. Well, I think the outline we had before we started, in a way, was contingent on um, having having access to to film Halima's mother. So, literally within the first week, that outline <laughs> changed, and then it, it kept changing, and then on, on literally on the last day, it changed back to what it was in the beginning. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we did. <laughs> but but also, it's a, uh, and I think I was telling Denise this earlier. You walk into these films, especially documentary, observational documentary, with a plan and then just having an open mind to learn. And it's something that I constantly, that we constantly are learning with each film that we make. You know, when it, you can plan for everything, but right up, right till the moment that you, you get up to, you, you, just, you can either, the plan goes well or you're there for the ride. And half the time, more than half the time with, with our film with you, it was, it was we were just going along for the ride. Um, but we knew the themes and we knew if there was a point where we felt lost, uh, and especially after your, uh, we, we, we filmed your mother and especially the editing process, we made sure to say like, well, how, what compels us? What's pulling on our heartstrings? What, why are we compelled in this manner? And that always centered us. So that was, at least for me, that was definitely more my outline where I just wanted to, to, to see how much of my heart uh, was drawn to the story and what pieces and then whatever that was, we try to incorporate that in. So, so yeah. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, well, first off, I'm just in total awe of you, and this movie has been was wonderful, and I'm just glad to be here. And um, I'm also a child of immigrants, and I like to think of myself as like a third culture kid, kind of in the middle, you know, but also nowhere <laughs> in many in some ways. Um, but I'm curious uh, what uh, for you, Halima, like what 
strength or what kind of skill do you think that has given you in this world uh like in terms of navigating culture like what uh, how has it benefited you in in the experiences and relationships you're building out in the world um but first of all thank you so much for coming um and then for me i'd say having the experiences of being somali american and um being a refugee it's taught me so much you know i think people always say like um we're, I'm good at like relationships. We're oh my god, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Me myself and I. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> I'm <laughs> good with relationships. Um, and like I think the communications like Somalis like uh, we're very oral and like we 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 love storytelling and um, oh god. <laughs> oh, I'd say. I'd say all of that combined, you know, like um, I look at my DMs and I see girls connecting to different parts of my stories. And I'll give you an example, like a being a refugee. So that will that might connect with somebody who's always lived in poverty, poverty stricken areas. And I get messages from even people in America who live in poverty and who are inspired by my story, who aren't Somali, aren't Muslim, but that they still gravitate towards that part of my story. And then same with African Americans. I'm also a black Muslim. We're Africans. We're, we're Somali. And um, the other thing is, too, though, um, I get messages from girls from, like, small towns of Wisconsin, you know, and, like, other small towns in America who look like Denise. But they still connect to the part where I came from a small town in St. Cloud and I was still able to make it in the fashion industry. So I think all of the stuff that I used to think when I, when I was little, I used to think, oh, man, these are like all things that work against me. They're the things that I cherish the most now. They're the they're my strengths. They're the things that make me me. They're the reason why people fall in love with me. And I see those as strengths now, if that makes sense. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you for your time, and uh, thank you, Halima, for being so brave and like believing in yourself. I think that is super cool. Um, I have two questions for the filmmakers. So, as a filmmaker, um, we're actually about to start filming a documentary, and you guys talked about the hesitation in the beginning, right? And I think documentaries are a big uh, commitment. So I'm curious to hear whether you feel like there's always that with every project, even if it's just a little bit. And also I'd like to hear how you determine the timeline for filming. That's something we still talk about, <laughs> especially that last part. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the answer, the quick answer is yes. Like, uh, I think if you, in, in my opinion, I think if you weren't hesitant and you went in with a full degree of confidence, you might be doing something wrong, actually. I think it's important to use doubt and fear and understand where that comes from with each day of shooting. Because we went into each day thinking, we have no idea where we're going to film today. But we're going to do what we can, make it work, and see, see what pulls on our heartstrings. So I think uh, use those emotions. I think that's important. Yeah, I think with, with any project, for me, for, whether it's photojournalism or film, I can't think of one where things went exactly the way that I expected. And if they did, that's almost a red flag because there's no wonder anymore. There's no sense of, of finding out what, what, you know, what's going to happen because it's already kind of, you've mapped it out in your head and there it is happening in real life. In reality, um, these things never play out the way that you, with the, the game plan that you have. And, and, and often, uh, this, uh, this is going to sound cliche, but often that ends up being better than what you, what you planned, as long as, like what Mike is saying, as long as you're open, as long as you don't shut down because it didn't go the way you expect. You kind of just keep going and you, and you wait. And to, with respect to the timeline, it, it's not ready until you feel it's ready. And that's, uh, I forget that saying that we, that we have with films, like they're never done, they're just. <laughs> films are never done, they're abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but, yeah, but I think that, <laughs> That's not what I. That's not quite what I mean. That wasn't it. That, was, that wasn't it. Okay. But I mean, you could, you could, you could make any film. You could just go indefinitely with almost any film, I think. But at some point, you have to feel like at least it's ready to show to other people, and um, that's. I think that's what determines the timeline. But yeah, I have to redeem my comment there. <laughs> uh, 
Wait, especially with our film uh, that we, we made with Halima and Denise and everyone. Uh, and, and I give, again, kudos to our editor as well, Eugene. I wish he was here. But we went back and forth, and there was a timeline. We, we've had a very tight timeline that we destroyed a long time ago. <laughs> like we, we, Because if we hit our timeline, it wouldn't have been good. I, I'll, I'll just flatly say I don't think it would have done justice to your story. I don't think it would have... I wouldn't have felt good about it, and I think I think Arthur and I are are um, both smart enough, but also confident enough to say that well, it's not ready. It's just not ready, and it took enough uh, work to make sure that we felt close to that point. So, yes, of course, I had if if I had my way, I would get in that room with Eugene for three more weeks. Two more weeks with you of shooting would have been great, but that's the abandoned part of it. At some point, you have to sort of say. Well, we have the heart of the story, right? So if we do, let's just run with the next step and see how that looks. And if we need to shoot some more, we'll figure that out. But it is, in a, in a way, you have to stand up and make those decisions and, and still be afraid, still hesit be hesitant, but also um, make that call when you feel like, well, maybe that there's nothing left, but, but that you know that you have something. I think when after we met your mother, we, were, we just both thought, yeah, we've... We're done. We, we can move on to the next step. So. I never heard back from them ever again. <laughs> <laughs> they ran. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing from them. <laughs> we drove out of St. Cloud. I'm joking. I'm joking, bit. guys. <laughs> I, I think because filmmaking is, is a, it's a group, it's almost always a, a group effort, one of the most important things that I've learned is, is to pick people who don't accept mediocrity, and Mike is someone who does not accept mediocrity. He, he goes for, like, his bar is very high. And so, like, to answer your question about the timeline, like, it's only when you reach that bar do we say, okay, it's ready to show someone. Yes. Thank you, Arthur. Other questions? Other yes. Uh, Halima and your team, thank you for uh, sharing her story. And uh, just a couple of things. First one, noticeably missing is your father in this documentary. And uh, another thank you for redefining for these uh, predominantly Eurocentric magazine what, it, what beauty looks like. Because as you mentioned, you were the first in 102 years, and we know that's because those who control the medium have defined the beauty as looking white, right? So uh, how has that impacted your experience? Being exposed to some racist ideologies out there. I mean, I would say, um, I, I look back at even the pageant, right? Um, Miss Minnesota USA gave me the opportunity to stand alongside a Minnes alongside uh, with Minnesota's most beautiful women. And I'm talking blonde, blue eyed, but also Somali with a hijab, you know, cause I was up there with my braces, <laughs> straight out of high school, thinking I could. <laughs> so I think beauty is how you see yourself. You know what, no one can define it for you, but I think a lot of us make the mistake of allowing fashion magazines and billboards and other people to define what beautiful is for us. Really, my mom was along right, all, all right about that one th <laughs> thing when she said, no one can tell you that you're beautiful besides yourself. You have to look in the mirror and tell that to yourself. You just have to see it within you, you know? Because what is the definition? It's whatever you make it. And um, I think part of the problem was we didn't see representation for a long time, and now little girls are having the opportunity. You know, I see lots of little girls today. Hi, hey, <laughs> hi. I see lots of beautiful little girls, and today they get to go and see a magazine and, and see somebody that either looks like their mom, their grandma, okay, maybe uh, not their grandma, <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> okay, wait, but you know what I mean? They get to see somebody, in their, like a woman in their life that they could relate to, and I think that's really nice, you know? Did I, I'm sorry, sir, did I answer your question? <laughs> And my dad, okay, so my dad passed away two years ago and I never got to meet him um, because we moved, I moved with my mom to America when I was seven. So yeah, I never really got to meet my dad. But I have a mom that's always been both mom and dad. So in a way, 
I feel like I never missed out on anything. I saw a hand there and a hand here. Ifra, her, um, she's wearing the stripes. Yeah, I got it. OK, cool. And uh, so I'm assuming that both Mike and Arthur, you guys had, didn't have like much, like, uh, uh, what do you call knowledge about the Somali culture or uh, or, in, or the Somali people in general? So I'm just assuming throughout the whole journey, what did you, what did you guys learn behind the scenes, like the juicy oh, stuff, the the of... unusual, the weird, the stuff that fascinated you after you actually got done with shooting that day? I mean, I'm going to give a quick caveat for Arthur. Arthur's been working in this community for a long time, actually. And I actually learned so much, obviously, through the process of filming, but a lot from Arthur because he spent so much time uh, just, yeah, you've been here for some, some time with the community. Well, I can't say, uh, first of all, definitely not an expert. <laughs> definitely still learning a lot. Um, I'm t yeah, I'm on the spot now, so it's hard to like come up with like d concrete things. But yeah, I think, I think I didn't get a sense of, I mean, being in, the, in that living room and seeing the, the mother-daughter dynamic, that's, you know, when I'm with my Somali friends here, it's, it's mostly not that, it's mostly us hanging out in, in a restaurant or something. So that's, that's not the kind of conversations I have or I have been privy to. And that was a window into a, the kind of conversation I, I imagine happens a lot in, in this. And I, I, not, I say I imagine, but I also know because my Somali friends that saw that have said, oh yeah, that, that's something that I've, a conversation I've had with my own parents. And so seeing in, in, into, into that um, definitely taught me quite a bit about uh, some of the dynamics within the community, but uh, yeah, that's that's the first thing that comes to mind. And I mean, <coughs> that's great. I, 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 food, well, yeah, the, the food. Restaurant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's funny, we filmed so much. We, we, we went to so many different places, yeah. <laughs> um, Gurkhalo? Gurkhalo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gurkhalo, yeah. I still can't pronounce it right. I took him to so many or Somali restaurants. Yes, that's right, yeah. that's right, yeah. No, I, I, I think, uh, I definitely was very open-minded walking in, and uh, I think, especially with the camera work, because uh, both Arthur and I were, were we had our cameras, uh, but for the most part, it really was filming in a way that it was a learning process. It was the culture and how people, uh, how everyone interact with each other, and I learned a lot through Arthur's experience working here, uh, because I would just sort of sit with him and sit with his friends from time to time, uh, but. I do have to say, uh, the community is one thing, but uh, Somali women is something that I think I didn't have much experience with in general. So to be able to be with you and your family and the many women there, it is a, it is different, but also, uh, uh, like uh, echoing Arthur's words, uh, a window into a world that I wasn't too privy to. So I'm not sure so much uh, concrete things I was learning, so much as an awareness and sensitivity uh, about uh, the importance of family, but also rippled across towards uh, a Chinese American perspective and, and, uh, and my family as well too, where some of the values are very common. Uh, uh, not the same, but I, I could see similarities and that's where I could feel uh, that where we could, where we could relate in that way. I just wanna say one thing. Uh, since I first came to um, Minnesota for the first time uh, in 2015, there's been someone here, uh, I can't see where he is, AK Hassan. Abdi Kadir Hassan, uh, one of the first, I think the second person I met in, in this community. And anything I've learned uh, about uh, the Somali experience has largely been uh, through, through him because he has introduced me to so many people and helped me under navigate through so many things. So I, I have to give credit to, including actually, he's the one that introduced me to Halima. So that's how, I, that's how we met, right? So uh, you, I have to give credit where it's due in that respect. Uh, so I had a quick question here, and then pass the mic on. Um, I had a, a couple questions, one for the filmmakers and one for Halima. Uh, for you guys, what was the editorial freedom or restriction that you had working with an outlet like Al Jazeera? What were the pros and cons that you would have? And I know your boss is here, so you don't have to <laughs> worry, but um, how would it be different than going through a Sundance or uh, some kind of film festival in that aspect? And could you speak on that? And then for Halima, I definitely remember early on after the pageant, the social media kind of backlash, the kind of conversations that were taking place. Um, and you spoke about this before, but 
Have you experienced people kind of changing their minds over time, seeing the integrity that you had, you know, going through the pageant your way? And what was that like for you? Okay. <laughs> I'll let the boys think. <laughs> okay, so for me, you rem I think like when I did Miss Minnesota USA, I had a ton of great feedback only because it was the first time that someone wore a hijab and it really, like, Denise, I think you remember, the next day IMG called and how did they know about me is because of the media attention. But you guys know, like, uh, with, with that good publicity, there's also comments and there's also opinions and then there's also something called Facebook. <sighs> I hope you guys are not on there, I'm kidding, no. <laughs> but it was just, people um, didn't, I think it was like the fear of the unknown, you know, like all they had known at that point was this girl is going to be competing and everybody thought like I was for sure like conforming, like for, you know what I mean? Like I, people were calling my mom and saying, oh, she's saying she's going to wear hijab, but what she really means is she's going to take it off, you know what I mean? And um, it was just like people did not know. And then I see some, some of my girls in the audience, yes, you. And then a year later, like, I remember the pageant, it was good, and it was also, like, I felt, so, like, just wobbling my knees, because I, I, I felt so awkward being the first, and it was so scary. And then a year later, I come, and I see eight beautiful, including, can you stand up, boo? Right there. I'm talking to you. Right there, yes! Can you please stand up? Yes! <laughs> If any of my girls who did the pageant last year are in the room, please stand up. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> okay, um, but you know, you know what I mean? And I was so happy to see you guys. I was so happy to meet all your beautiful mamas. And my mom was happy, and she was in the audience, and she was so excited. I was like, where was this energy when I was competing? <laughs> but you know what? That's what, I, did I, am I even going the right direction with this? <laughs> Yes, yes, and even even with the si signing with the agency, you know, like people didn't know. I didn't even know. Like I walked into some of those studios, but I, I packed my hijabs, <laughs> my turtlenecks, because I did not know if they were ready, but they were. And I think that's what it was. Like people for the longest time did not ever see a hijab wearing model. So when it was time for me to do 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 that job, it was what is she gonna look like? How is she gonna? Oh, no way. No way is it possible to be in that industry with a hijab and still, you know, remain true to yourself. And then I literally up to this day will have parents come up to me and say, you know what? You're a good girl. I misjudged you. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Can you uh, call my mom? <laughs> <Can you not? laughs> but I think it's just, yes, yeah, people just in the beginning feared the unknown. And um, that's why we need more girls just you know, staying true to themselves, but also challenging those, those, uh, what do you call, what, misconceptions and stuff like that. And it was also half and half, you know what I mean? Like, it's already hard to put yourself out there in a field where you literally don't see anybody who looks like you. And then on the other hand, your community either makes you and breaks you, and the Somali community, time and time again, has done nothing but support me, even though we had some hard days, and I had to do some convincing. <laughs> <laughs> but I love my community. You know, you cannot be a successful person without your community, and you cannot forget where you came from. That's why I'm always, like, always repping. You know, I'm Somali. My family's Somali. You know, I, I share the pride of the Somali people. I tell all of our, you know what I mean? Because I think that part, it's important to highlight your community. And also, wait, 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 I'm not even done. I'm not even done, guys. Also, though, my Minnesota community, who does not, maybe do, don't even look like me, but again, like, when, I, when we moved to this country, let me tell you something. We did not have a car. We were in a homeless shelter for six months. But who gave us rides? It was people who literally looked nothing like us, but they still, time and time again, did everything they could to help us. I'm, I'm talking about my teachers who stayed after school with me, who would literally pull me out of recess and study with me. Um, our first caseworker, Greg, he uh, 
literally took us shopping and bought us our first mittens and uh, uh, what do you call it? jackets, coats, because he knew like uh, the uh, what do you call the um, like welfare like it doesn't just come on time. So he did that out of his own pocket. And those are all people who are not from the Somali, Somali community, but again, people who are in my community nonetheless. So thank you guys. Um, trying to follow that. Did this, you guys have time? Yeah, to trying, trying to follow that. No, I was I was unwrapped by by your by your by your uh, wonderful speech. Um, I think really quickly. Al Jazeera, just to answer your question, off the heels of what you just said, it wasn't that hard of a sell in terms of the compelling notes of her story. It's a beautiful story. I mean, we can talk all day about stylizing uh, the shots and referencing different movies and, and, and making something great, but it, there wasn't much. The, she did all the heavy lifting in terms of a really beautiful, inspiring, fantastic story. And so Al Jazeera knew that. And I think for us, all of us, uh, we just wanted to do that justice. And in, in addition to that, there wasn't, I, and I'm, I'm thinking about my conversations with Poe here and others, but there was a lot of creative liberty. I think they trust independent filmmakers and not just filmmakers in general, but us. I mean, like I, I've known Poe for some time. I've known uh, others within the Al Jazeera family for some time where they put a lot of faith in us uh, to put our hearts into this. and. When we get too close, they tell us, when we get too close to the story and the story's not working quite well, they'll tell us because they care about how we're approaching the story and that we're all telling the story together. So um, it is a collaborative process. Now, we've had our tough moments, there's no doubt. Intense conversations and, and disagreements. But what I really enjoy about the people who I've worked with at Al Jazeera, uh, and, 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 and I'm not sure to what extent, uh, it's similar to you, Arthur, but I think what's what's been very important for me is if it doesn't if it's not working quite well, if the story's not gelling well, or the visuals don't make much sense, they'll disagree with you. But if if oftentimes I disagree back, and then they say, "Well, prove it. Well, show us that it's going to work." And I say, "Okay, fine. Let's let's take some time and like make this better than it was because it's not working for both of us for some reason." So it is. It is a journey together. We're all trying to make something good. We all are focused on the same goal. So it isn't like a top-down, bottom-up feeling so much as we're just constantly in discussion over and over because we're all headed towards the same uh, product, I believe, uh, same, same film, same cinematic piece. Um, so that's been my experience uh, with, with the network so far. Arthur? Well, I've gotten to know Poe in the Al Jazeera network uh, through this experience. And um, I just have to say, you, Poe, you talk a lot about helping and developing uh, filmmakers who are up and coming. And let me say, I have learned that you really mean it. And in this process, I, I have learned what that means because you gave us the space creatively to work and to tell the story how we see fit. And um, that doesn't mean that you just stepped back and didn't say anything. You know. We had these conversations back and forth, but they were constructive, and then it never felt like we were just following orders from the top to, about how to tell this story, which is honestly a, a fear I had at first. I didn't, I didn't know how that would look, and you really I, now I get it because I feel like as, as a filmmaker, you've you've allowed uh, me and I, I can say for Mike as well. I, I think to develop to, to develop our style and, and our, our craft. So um, that's one of the reasons I really value this um, the experience of having worked for. Um, as a commission. Um. As an Al Jazeera employee, I approve these messages. So we did not force them to say that, though. Um, and I do want to where's shout my, out. Where's Pro. my paycheck? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You'll get a USB drive. Oh, yeah, That's I what we give. About Al Jazeera. <laughs> By all means. No, will, will I get a raise? <laughs> Just to be discussed later. Um, I do want to shout out Poe. Poe Si Ting is my colleague and an Emmy nominated director. She's also the senior commissioning producer for um, Al Jazeera's Witness Strand, and that's the one you saw there. Um, I know we've taken a lot of your time here, but I've heard lots of good questions. We probably have time for how many more? Ooh. She's checking. Suspense, drum roll. 
One more question. But that will allow us afterwards for you to take pictures, selfies, hashtag Halima, talk to Halima and the filmmakers afterwards. So who will the last question go to? <laughs> Hi, Malika. Hey. OK, so um, first I just want to say how happy I am to be here. The film was great, and it's so great to see you in person. Um, and I just want to express my admiration for you. And I'll keep this very short, um, but I admire you far past your accomplishments. I just like the fact that I can relate to you, um, and it's great to have that. Um, so a scene in the film that stood out to me that I want to ask you about is when you were sitting kind of like in the window still in the hotel and you still haven't been booked for a show and you're sitting there just kind of like pondering. Um, and I point that out because, um, so I'm an aspiring model and I'm constantly day in and out like sending emails to, um, wow, I'm so nervous, why am I? <laughs> I'm sitting, you're yeah, among so, friends. Yeah. You're doing great. Um, so I'm always sending emails um, and pictures of myself to these agencies that I never hear back from. So I kind of just want to know, like, what helped you remain hopeful and kind of just like grounded to like keep going? <sighs> I'm glad you brought that up because it can be really um, hard sometimes. Just on your, because you you think like, am I not am I not good enough? Like da da da. But it's also important to know when it's your time, it's your time. And today look at me like this collection is um the max mara collection i'm not even trying to promote y'all but <laughs> this is like it's an exclusive collection so whatever show i didn't get that day i'm the face of this collection you know what i mean so it, better things come no matter what you know what i mean don't ever think oh it must not be. don't ever stop chasing your dream and then the other thing that keeps me humble and like to the ground and keeps my like uh, focus is really having my good support system, my best friends from li literally from St. Cloud. You know, they knew me since I was like probably digging boogers out of my nose in sixth grade. You know, I'm talking about my friend Lizeth, Ekron, who we have three hour phone conversations and they hear everything, the good, the stressful, everything, you know, hectic schedules. Denise Wallace on the road, like I've, you don't understand how many times I cried to this woman, her and Libby. And then also my other girlfriends, Muna, Adna, uh, what's your name again? <laughs> Aziza. Yeah, you know what I mean? Every girl needs to have her tribe. You need to find your people. You need to find the people who believe in you, who see the best in you, who remind you, you know, don't stop chasing, don't stop believing in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, girl, who will? Who will? Nobody. I'm asking you, who will? <laughs> and then don't be sending these agencies no pictures, girl. Uh-uh, <laughs> don't be doing that. Let them come to you, but put yourself out in, let's talk afterwards. I got, I got let's some talk. tips. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as we wrap up here, I wanna do a rapid fire, 15 seconds. Next project, go. Oh. Oh, thank you. All right, we'll start there. <laughs> I'm still I'm still finishing another documentary here. Okay, in, in all right. Minutes. Soon to be announced once it's done. That works, Mike. It is not a fashion documentary. <laughs> um, Mike has a girlfriend in the audience, by the way. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, my hair. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's my girlfriend. Has has not much to do with the next project, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. It's great. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> um, I'm going back to the Congo in a sense with uh, another documentary. So it's been I've been working on that for for some time as well. So, but this um, this was an, a very very enjoyable uh, process, and I'm really I think I can speak for Arthur. We're both very happy with the story that we've 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 gathered. Halima, your turn. I'm so excited. I'm actually launching a pop grip with Pop Socket, and half of all sales will go to UNICEF. So check that out. Where can we find it? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Denise? <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> when it launches. We'll all know. Okay, <laughs> all right. Oh, wait, did good. it not launch yet? <laughs> <laughs> tease, tease. Okay. I almost got fired, guys. Woo. Right. Okay, yeah, look, at, look for that. 
All right, stay tuned. Okay, so the Halima doc that you all just saw and loved is now live on YouTube. You can go check it out at Witness oh, yeah. Al Jazeera on YouTube and also on Instagram TV on Witness's account. That's AJ Witness. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors, watch it again, and continue tweeting your thoughts with hashtag Halima. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, of course, to Spin for having us and hosting us.